you somewhere. There he is. Hello, Lee. Hello. Um, don't listen to him if he tells you the parties are evil and you need like 8,000 people in the Congress. I'm joking. <laughs> parties are good. 8,000, more like 1,600. They won't let me. I'm, I'm only introducing. I'm not talking. 8,000. Great debate. Oh, there's another debate to be had. So it's, this is a really, really great uh, panel that we have today. It was a pleasure to be with uh, Dr. Julia Hazari from Marquette University, who's also over at the Library of Congress in the Kluge Center uh, this semester, working on some great stuff. I'm excited to hear from her. We have Charlie Bolton from uh, Senator Portman's office, uh, who has introduced the End of the <coughs> Shutdown Act. And we have Brittany Madney from uh, Congressman Balderson's office, who also introduced the, the House Companion to that. And I guess I should say our topic today is America's Longest Shutdown, the pause and effect on congressional power. One other thing I would add before we get started, you have comment cards on your seat. This is very important, so listen up. If you fill those cards out and you say good things, because if you say bad things, I'm just going to throw them all out. But if you say good things about us and how much you love us, no, seriously, if you fill those cards out and you turn them in, then you could win some R Street swag. I'm not going to tell you what that swag is, because I want you to want it. <laughs> no, it's really good swag, I promise you. And so turn it in, please, please. But this is not just for us to sit here and listen to ourselves talk. This is also a service, right? We want to make Congress great again. We want to help staffers do their jobs. We want to help members achieve their goals. We want to help people on the outside better understand what's happening on the inside. And we can't do that if we aren't doing that. And so please tell us if you think we're doing that and how we can do it better. Um, but with that, I would turn it over to, to Dr. Ryan. Okay, great. So I'm either the best or worst person to start this out because I completely ignored the specific questions in the prompt. And I, I instead I wanted to talk about some very general themes of how I'm thinking about the both the shutdown that occurred, um, it's uh, both the, the way that it ended and also the, the possibility, the looming possibility of um, another shutdown, which last time I checked the news looked like it wasn't going to happen. Probably someone knows better than me. Um, and so I'm actually a scholar of the presidency, and this is a little bit through a presidential lens, but hopefully that'll be helpful as people think about um, about what Congress's role and the opportunities created by the particular politics of the of the moment. So I'm thinking about the politics of the moment, shutdown politics, and I think the more general kind of gridlock gridlock politics in terms of three gaps. The first one is the gap between Trump's base and the rest of the of the country, which I think is both remarkable and not. Um, I didn't want to throw a bunch of numbers at everybody. You can look them up for yourself. 29% um, of the country said in January that they favored substantially expanding the border wall and that a deal without wall funding was unacceptable, <coughs> a number that comports pretty well with what polling experts and scholars understand as Trump's kind of core constituency. Um, well, that policy is very unpopular with the general <laughs> public. That's not unusual to put this in broader context for presidents to have a signature or policy that is that is not very popular, that faces pushback and congressional failure, um, sometimes even if, if it is popular, Bush and Social Security, Obama and gun control, um, Clinton and health care, uh, backlash even with policies that are passed, Obama and the Affordable Care Act. So it's not like this is an unfamiliar dynamic, but this is unique in the sense that this is really a, a centerpiece of Trump's campaign, both for the nomination and for the presidency, and for the, the uniqueness of his uh, for of his presidency. I think makes that more important. And then also the, the budgetary situation that we've been in for a number of years, his reliance on a series of continuing resolutions, puts that gap between who Trump is responding to and the broader public opinion of the rest of the country. I think in um, more kind of puts that in a position to make politics more precarious. The second gap, this one's a little more, a little bit more abstract, is the gap between politics and policy. Um, and this is something I've been observing throughout, not just the Trump years, but the Obama years as well, um, that there's an increasing gap between messaging and the actual, actual policy needs on the ground. And I thought the discussion around the border wall particularly illustrated this, that the border wall resonates with this particular segment of the electorate, is an important part of the policy discussion. Border experts do not recognize the president's proposal as reflecting reality on the ground. Also on the Democratic side, 
There were some critics of the idea that the Democrats would hold the line on this particular symbolic policy. Um, I also think that Democrats have sort of gotten in on this game of a kind of post-policy messaging um, situation, things like the Green New Deal. So it's, to me, this is a little bit of a two-sided coin. Political appeals are not always linked to real problems or practical solutions, and also the political figures build their careers on appeals that are not necessarily linked to either their real influence and ability to get things done, um, or to their, their, the stature of themselves, their institutions, um, the leverage that they have in DC. One of the implications I think that the shutdown had is that the shutdown actually narrowed that gap in some ways. Um, it made policy <coughs> real. It made the, the effects of policy felt. Um, and so I think as we think about these gaps, some of them are widening and some of them are, are narrowing. Um, the politics of the shutdown, I think, did um, did narrow the gap between the kind of partisan messaging and, and the kinds of political words people respond to and then policy on the ground. Um, the final one is, is, this is very presidency-centric, but I think in this gap lie opportunities for Congress, um, is the gap between formal and informal presidential power. Um, there are a number of, of political scientists writing on the internet who've written a lot about Trump being a weak president who lacks leverage and influence. Um, but I think that the important thing to pay attention to here is that that happens on top of, um, of great formal capacity. And one of the ways in which Leader McConnell talked about the, the shutdown deal was not doing something that the president could veto. Um, of course, we have this looming question about the president declaring a national emergency. Um, formal, formal powers that the presidency has, um, whereas lack of, apparent lack of leverage um, within, within Washington, um, and also this kind of partial leverage over his party that I'm not, I'm not entirely sure at this moment how I would characterize that. My impressions and feelings of that have um, have shifted. So I think <clears throat> going kind of deeper into this formal, informal question, um, we've had several instances over the past few years where the, the formal rules have been stripped of the informal norms and practices that, that dress them up. Um, and we saw this in, in the very nomination of Trump in the, the, the formal primary process unfold and not just the informal elite process. Um, to choose a president. We, we saw this under Obama and debt ceiling votes, that that's kind of been pro forma and then it became um, a moment of crisis. And then also in, in shutdowns, that the formal rules allow for the government to shut down, but the norms and informal rules that we follow make that, you know, prohibit that or, or proscribe that. Um, and so maybe our formal institutions are not really set up to solve governing problems without informal norms. So those are the gaps I'll be watching as some of them narrow and some of them some of them widen, and that's kind of the perspective from, from academia. Uh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. Thanks, um, so um, I'm Charlie Bolton, um, Senator Portman's legislative assistant on uh, budget and general economic issues. Um, and um, I cover pensions for the Senator as well on the subcommittee for uh, Social Security and pensions and family policy. Um, so um, one of our original co-sponsors, Lamar Alexander, um, mentioned uh, the other week that he thought that government shutdowns were the equivalent of chemical warfare to budget policy. <laughs> um, and um, I, you know, we certainly agree that um, it's not worth um, having some sort of leverage for a particular policy goal. Um, um, you know, and, and jeopardize the government to, to try to get that <coughs> policy goal. Um, the um, the costs of government shutdowns um, are real. Um, the CBO came out with a report last Monday um, saying that the uh, budget, the economic impact would be 11 billion of the last government shutdown, um, which was maybe lower than the 2013 <coughs> shutdown because the 2013 shutdown was a whole of government shutdown. This last shutdown was like 25 percent discretionary spending, um, but uh, but that actually the offsetting demand in subsequent quarters wouldn't even fully be offset, and um, three billion would be the permanent GDP loss. Um, that there may, there may be some false precision there, but there's a real impact, and there's a budgetary impact as well because 
some of that $3 billion would have been taxable economic activity. And we saw that with, for example, reduced demand for airline tickets, um, given, you know, we heard a lot from Ohioans on, um, on delays at airports and um, aviation safety concerns. Um, so, um, you know, the budget, but there's, given, given that federal employees receive back pay retroactively, the revenue side is what you look at on the budgetary impact, and there is a real budgetary impact. Um, the um, solution that my boss has had, um, and of course he's been trying to be constructive in uh, helping both sides get to an agreement on, on the broader um, immigration debate, um, is to, but, but additionally we think that in whatever, whatever Congress does to move forward on um, improving border security and addressing DACA and, um, and funding, funding the remaining seven appropriations bills for this fiscal year, we should include um, a solution to make sure we don't we never have government shutdowns again. We don't want we don't want to just deter government shutdowns through things like putting member pay in escrow during shutdowns. We want to actually prevent them from ever happening again. Um, and the End Government Shutdowns Act, which, which my boss has introduced since the 112th Congress, um, he actually <coughs> campaigned on it in 2010 when he first ran for Senate. It's an important bid. Um, would create an automatic continuing resolution for any regular appropriations bill that is not funded by October 1st, or as in the case in January, if that regular appropriations bill was under CR, if Congress doesn't supersede that CR, um, then there would be a, there would be a CR for, the, for, the, for each regular appropriations bill. So each regular appropriations bill would be treated separately. Um, and after 120 days to encourage lawmakers to, to keep working toward an agreement instead of just leaving the appropriations spot process on autopilot, we want to facilitate the appropriations process. There would be a 1% cut across the board, um, and that, that would give lawmakers, for example, until Christmas um, from when the fiscal year starts, October 1st. Um, and, um, and then every 90 days thereafter, there'd be an additional 1% cut. Um, so we think that's a pretty modest approach. It's um, probably the most middle of the road um, of the auto CR bills that's been introduced. Um, and um, it's, it, it's been bipartisan in the majority of the, in three of the five Congresses that we've introduced them since the 112th Congress in the Senate. Um, Brittany will speak to how it's bipartisan in the House now. Um, but, you know, in general, um, the bill would um, save taxpayer dollars as a result of lost economic growth during government shutdowns, um, treat all discretionary spending equally. Um, right now, 53% of discretionary budget authority is defense spending, so we don't think it biases either conservative or liberal priorities. This is a bipartisan good government bill. Um, and reduce pressure for haphazard last-minute budget deals um, that lawmakers are asked to vote on before they have even read them, which we've seen more and more in recent years. Um, and obviously, um, when agencies um, run, run under CR, some, some, some some staffers have asked, well, why don't you just have a straight CR with no cuts? Um, you know, we saw in 27, fiscal year 2017 what happens when an agency like the Department of Defense has to operate almost a whole fiscal year under CR. And so we view the 1% cuts as um, facilitating the important but responsible budget. Um, the important but difficult budget choices that lawmakers have to make to avoid long-term CRs. Um, so um, our bill is supported by the Federal Law Enforcement Association um, and uh, some, some federal contractor groups who obviously didn't receive back pay. Um, and, uh, and, and we really appreciate Park Street um, helping us um, get the word out on it and working toward um, any, any government shutdown permanently. My name is Brittany Madney. I am the Legislative Director for Congressman Balderson. Mr. Balderson is excited and honored to be able to introduce Senator Portman's companion bill in the House. H.R. 791 <coughs> is our bill number. There are some other uh, options floating out there, so if you're interested, take a look at 791. That is the exact text of Senator Portman's in the Senate, just matched for House rules. I want to go back a little bit to something Charlie spoke about moment ago in terms of the economic impact. 
One of the questions I've been getting quite frequently from staff is why is this important? Shouldn't we just end the shutdown? And aren't we about to strike a deal to do this properly? <coughs> sure, that might be the case. But that 35 days with the governmental shutdown caused some serious difficulties for American citizens, federal employees, <coughs> and otherwise. And that's something that Congressman Balderson is really concerned about. maybe we can make it up unlikely but possible three billion of that 11 billion is gone it's from last quarter we're never getting it back that's three billion dollars that we're looking at when we're already in massive debt it's unsustainable it's not responsible and it's something that isn't just a government problem it's not just a congressional problem it's something that impacts <coughs> real americans every day if this country is in massive debt like it is now that means Americans are in massive debt and are going to have to pay the price down the road. Why should we continue down that path when there's a solution? And that's where we're really excited about this bill. Just for reference, by the way, I know there are some people who aren't super comfortable with CBO numbers. Chamber of Four also put out their version, and they think that the first quarter loss is about $6 billion. So across the board, everybody thinks that this is problematic. One of the supporters that we have is the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget. And Maya McGinnis has been supportive of our um, notion to prevent shutdown specifically through the auto CR attached to an auto cluster. Is it because this is fiscally responsible? Yes. But it's also because we're looking for solutions. We're looking forward to solution-based agreements. We're looking at legislation that does not favor one side or the other. Evidence of that is that we currently have 10 co-sponsors and uh, that 20% of them are Democrats. And interestingly, one is from New Jersey, one is from California. I bring that up because one might think, oh, a California Democrat signing on to a conservative Republican from Ohio's legislation, what's going on here? And it's just demonstration to you, proof. This is not a, type, this is not a partisan issue, this is a bipartisan effort. In fact, I would make the argument that this is not bipartisan even, it's nonpartisan. This is just good governance. This is just being responsible. Um, and as Charlie sort of alluded to, we're looking to encourage action. So there are some people who are a little bit concerned about the idea of an auto sequester at this 1% drop. I would like to highlight that members of Congress would have 120 days to start opening it up to get our jobs done. 120 days is a long time. We were only shut down for 35 days. 35 is problematic, but if we give you 120 days, if we have to have the pressure on, if Charles and I are sitting there in our offices with our bosses trying to work out a deal, if we can't get something done in 120 days, there's a bigger problem, right? And so at that point, we would end up with a 1% um, effort to encourage further action on the part of all members. And uh, with that, that's kind of that's it. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so thank you all. And before we open it up for questions, I thought I would very briefly try to kind of bring it all together and frame it, because one of the things I love about America is that none of it makes sense. It's all in tension with each other. It's all in conflict with each other. And there are no easy or simple solutions. They're just not. And, and some solutions can be great in some respects and not great in others. Uh, and this has been a very frustrating and rewarding thing in my career, both working on the Hill and then also studying Congress after the Hill and, and writing about it. But, the first thing, the key idea I want to <coughs> want to leave you with is this idea of energetic but limited government, right? Uh, we wanted both. You know, progressives said we want energetic government. Conservatives said we wanted limited government. Well, you know, the framers said we want both of those things. Let's take these two opposites and put them together. Right? So that's what we have. That's what the Constitution was all about. Then, well, how do you have that? Well, what does it imply? It implies a focus on this space, the space of where the stuff of governing happens, where that energetic activity happens. Right, so think about space, and think about how government is limited in that space. 
So then the challenge becomes, well, how do you preserve, how do you buttress that space? And the solution, as we all know, is the separation of powers, right? And that's the kind of key thing to preserve the energetic yet limited <coughs> government, to prevent us from kind of descending into this Polybian cycle that you used to see happen all the time where the framers, so far as I can tell, for the first time in human history, cracked the code and figured out how to preserve the space in which politics occurs on a sustainable basis. So that's one element. Another thing I want to I love about this topic is that it really illustrates what I see as one of the key tensions in our politics right now. And that is this tension between politics and administration, right? And politics as the kind of art of, or practice of persuasion versus administration as the application of expertise, right? And both elements are absolutely vital. And we have in conservatives say, we want to deconstruct the administrative state. Well, what does that mean, right? Th this is a challenge. The administrative state is alive and well, it is with us. And the question is, how do you deal with it? How do you, how do you marry politics and administration and the rational benefits of administration with the kind of legitimate um, imperatives of politics in a democratic republic like America. That's absolutely critical. And so what happens, looking at that tension in Congress, right? Politics and persuasion, and how does it relate to the executive branch and the application of expertise, right? And how do you balance the trade-offs? And I think that's really important to look at. So when you put all those things together, and then you say, okay, let's look at funding, right? Some people say, let's have you know, a shutdown. Some people say shutdowns are bad. I think that some shutdowns can be very destructive. I think the last one was, right? I mean, the question becomes, what's the point, right? And how does it relate to the preserving the space, buttressing the space, and also how does it relate to exercising kind of legitimate you know, functions of politics and of administration? And you know, when you think about the power of the purse in, the, in this frame, there's kind of three different ways, right? And Madison tells us two of them, and Fifth Federalist 58, I'll pull it up real quick. The power over the purse may in fact be regarded as the most complete and effectual weapon with which any constitution can arm the immediate representatives of the people for obtaining a redress of every grievance and for carrying into effect every just and solitary measure. So he's just told us two ways to think about the power of the purse. One is a way to buttress the space in which politics occurs, to keep our energetic government still limited. Right? But he's also told us that the power of the purse can be used as a, as a source of leverage to persuade, to persuade your fellow colleagues in the House and the Senate, or to persuade the administration of the American people of the, of the efficacy of a, a course of action. But there is a third, and I think that it also, and it speaks to, I think, the, what um, the, the bills here are, are trying to address, which in a big government with lots of different activities, there is the problem of administration. There is the problem of the, rap, uh, the rational application of expertise, right? And, and how do you make that as smooth as possible? How do you prevent unnecessary disruptions, unnecessary waste of financial resources? And so that's looking at the power of the purse through this lens of the administration of that power. And all three of those I would implore you to think of as legitimate. And all three of those are very important. And not one or the other, I think, <coughs> takes precedence necessarily. But at the end of the day, this concept is so rich and so nuanced and so detailed. I mean, this thing is, this is exactly the kind of thing I like talking about right when I wake up in the morning. Because there, it, no matter which way you go, there's just challenges and briar patches, right? And so I think if we enter our discussion with that kind of frame in mind, it, it leads to a more productive and a more fulfilling discussion. So with that, I would uh, open it up to either if any of the panelists want to respond to each other, but not to me, um, <laughs> or if I just open it up for questions. I don't know, I defer it to you all, and then we'll go to the, the audience. Do you want to respond to questions? Rock and roll? Go ahead. So, uh, hi, I'm Bill Thomas with the Congressional Research Service. Thank you for your insights today. Very interesting. Uh, this was a partial set of shutdown, so there seem to be many variations of shutdown <coughs> that we've had. Um, and fundamentally, there's, uh, I wonder if there's really not a bigger problem here uh, than uh, just continuing resolution, which is that there's only one reason why this was a partial shutdown. Congress didn't pass the appropriations bills for those agencies who were caught out in the partial shutdown. Um, and had they, there would have not been a shutdown. So my question is, Congress has plenty of problem anymore passing an appropriations bill. Its fundamental purpose, the power of the purse, we just heard it. And it can't get that done. Isn't that something we really need to address? Isn't that more than absolutely something we need to address? Band-aids here and there? Um, yes, I, I agree. Um, Congress has only passed all 12 regular appropriations bills three times since 1978. The last time was in 1997. Um, so, right now, the you know the, that process is not working. Um, 
One of the requirements of the Joint Select Committee on Budget and Appropriations process that Juan was there last year um, was consolidating the number of appropriations bills, um, which um, I can't speak for my boss on, but I would personally be supportive of. Um, there, there has been, I, I think there were proposals to shrink the number to four and 12. There's also been to six in the past. Um, but that, that's one of the budget process reform ideas that I think is worth <coughs> One of the complicated pieces of this is that budget and appropriations policy is just so nuanced and complex. And in the former life, I worked on budget committees. I think it's a, a struggle that budget nerds like Carly and I have when <coughs> dealing with um, these kinds of issues is that it is complex, it is nuanced, and staff and members have such a massive amount of information thrown at them, not just on this issue, but on every issue at all times of the day and night, and how can you sit down and have a real conversation about how to fix this process when we're in the middle of a problem? That's one of the reasons that I'm personally excited about this piece of legislation. I think it might give us a little breathing room so that we can sit there and have a conversation about what needs to change, what needs to be fixed. Obviously, the Joint Select Committee <coughs> made a great first effort last year. Unfortunately, we didn't see a product on the floor. Um, and I don't think it had anything to do with the work that happened in that committee. I think that they worked incredibly hard and diligently to get this thing done. The problem is a lack of understanding, and a lack of understanding is a lack of appetite. And we can't have space to grow in those two areas if you're constantly drinking out of a fire hose. And that's where we are right now. And if we look at the floor schedule in the House this week, Obviously, we have a, a couple of days that we're no longer voting for unrelated issues, but most of the oxygen in the room, in the chamber of the House of Representatives, is being taken up by the current situation. So let's take it off the table. And I'd like to pull these two things together and especially, sorry, if the question <laughs> also is going to broaden it beyond just budget and appropriations, because I think there is a tendency, and it is, I think, a very complicated thing that the members of the staff don't fully understand. But it seems to me this shutdown and what could have been a shutdown in 2014 was over immigration, and an issue that, the, that divides the parties right down the middle, um, Demo Republicans against Republicans, Democrats against Democrats, and, and it's interesting you see in, in that that seems to be the proximate cause, the, the division, and if you look at the, what Pelosi, the opening bid of the House Democrats, was the exact same maneuver that Paul Ryan used in his bid to House Republicans and conservatives to kind of punt the ball down the road, which is let's just get a short-term CR down the road so we can avoid this tough issue, right? And it seems like it's oh. it's these other issues that may be interjecting and complicating the acting kind of administration via Congress. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm not 100% sure what, what, what you're, know, just, as, uh, talk about that yeah. sweet, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, wanna, I, I will start by saying, I'm so grateful for people who work on things like the details of budget policy. Um, which I don't do, but yeah, I mean, that's sort of the thing I've been thinking about through all of this, and, and particularly through the, the politics of the, um, through this specific shutdown and the discourse going on on the left around the, um, around the wall, and the kind of, one thing that sort of stuck in my brain was people referring to the wall as a monument to white supremacy, which I'm not quoting because I necessarily agree or disagree, but just because I thought it was, it's a very powerful symbol that once you've said that, it makes it very hard for your representatives to, um, to sign on for some. <laughs> right, exactly. That's if you're a Democrat from a, a blue district. Um, you know, immigration, this takes, this takes me to a, to a dark place historically as I think about That's issues that have, right, that have, right, that have, that have traditionally, issues that have traditionally run through each party and that begin to divide between the parties and that have been intractable and touch on basic issues of who belongs and who's an American, that is not a great track record, um, is an end of very few, very few observations of that, but one of them um, resulted in civil war, so uh, that's not great. Um, you can quote me on that, civil war is not great. <laughs> um, yeah, fair, okay, so. Um, the, I don't, I mean, I don't know, like, I don't necessarily see it going down that that road, but I think that's right. Like, I think, so I'm actually convinced by my colleagues up here that there are procedural solutions that could, 
I like your phrase, breathing room. Um, but I do think that there are some confrontations over the problem, and I do think also, and I'll say this in a room of good governance fans, I'm, I'm pro-conflict. Um, I think that there are, there were a lot of costs to this shutdown. I would, it had tremendous human costs, but I do think that pretending there's not a conflict over something like immigration when there is one is not productive. Um, so there needs to be a productive way to talk through that. And to the extent that I'm pro conflict, I think that that makes sense to think about creating institutional space, not just for agreement or nonpartisan or bipartisan, but like that is a space in which we can then have, have it out over immigration policy. I don't know if that answers your question. No, it's perfect. Great. Not um, in the back. Yeah, thank you. This is an incredible discussion. So uh, my name is Jeff Adelstein. <laughs> I've got two hats on with the Consensus Building Institute and um, this new organization, the National Institute for Civic Innovation. And I want to throw it, I guess something that hasn't been said, which is uh, in some ways I feel like all's fair in politics and if people want to battle over a few billion dollars and feel like they can take a political hit within a four trillion dollar budget, then go for it. I mean, and if that doesn't work, then you get voted out. So, um, but the piece, I, I guess I want to throw out is, you know, for some people it's like, okay, so the government shuts down, so what? I mean, for some people that's good, whether they're the general public or policy people. But the piece, I guess, that really worries me is one million workers in the government who now don't want to work in that sector. And it seems to me, and maybe this is part of the message in this <coughs> of the aisle, I want to throw it out there, that whether you believe in bigger government or smaller government, I think everybody wants to be able to have federal workers who perform effectively at their job. And the numbers I hear about, you know, like hiring that was happening, people looking outside the government during the shutdown, it just seems to me that we're going to continue to diminish the whole, I hate to say it, you know, but like quality of a workforce. And it's an entire sector. I mean, if we said we're shutting down the auto sector and we're going to lose all those workers. I mean, it's just those impacts, and I, and I guess I just want to throw that out there because I haven't heard that. <coughs> uh, and to me, sense. that's one of the biggest pieces of damage of this whole sector. Charlie, do you want to? Yeah, and I think you've got to um, I mean, I agree with all of that. Um, you know, additionally, the federal contractors who um, may think, you know, we're not able to receive back pay. contracts with the same zeal um, but um, I, I think the federal contractors are with uh, in, in the raw materials space had more um, were more effective than say the bigger federal contractors for Booz Allen and Ernst and Young for Deloitte who were made whole by other companies um, but um, but that that is definitely an issue and, and you, we, you know we, we want to highlight sort of the human impact of shutdowns um, which too often gets lost in numbers. Over the last couple of days, there's been a series of, or really the last week or so, there have been a series of hearings, specifically on the side of our people with information and tech as well, looking at the human impact of the shutdowns. Um, my boss is on the Consensus Committee, and one of his pet peeves was most interested in is how this has impacted small businesses, both in terms of business owners who are unable to access tech services or relies more heavily on other services that were still operating during the shutdown, or some of these contractors. So I think it's a conversation members are having. But, but I want to get a point on these, uh, please. Uh, yeah, I'm Charlie Clark, the government executive. Uh, I was wondering if this issue could come up again uh, this week about Senator McConnell's decision not to bring bills to the floor unless the Trump executive would sign it. Because in fact, the Congress can pass the bills with veto proof majorities. So I'm wondering if this comes up in the Republican conference. Uh, yeah, I think it's. I think it speaks to what. Um, I, I don't know. Yet. Not not to my knowledge. Um, but of course you're right. Um, I mean, the PR that we passed um, in December. I think on December 21st, we passed with 71 votes. So that would have had a veto proof majority. Um, I'll just point out for clarification: any senator can move to proceed to a bill on the floor, or offer an amendment, and force a vote. It's not just the majority leader. It's not just McConnell. In fact, McConnell moved to proceed to bills when he was the minority leader, not the majority leader. So, 
any senator can do so. And to answer your question, this, I've sat in many of these discussions for a very long time, and, and this does not generally come up. I think the leaders have cultivated an environment in which um, the rank and file don't act and can't act. Um, I remember very well the time when the budgets were passed every year normally without controversy. Um, and so it seems to me that on the one hand, you have <coughs> very experienced, long-serving members of both the House and the Senate who should be very knowledgeable about the legislative process and the budgetary process. So on the one hand, I'm puzzled by how uh, there doesn't seem to be that knowledge. And on the other hand, you, there seems to be a lack of incentive. And what would it take um, <coughs> if one assumes that these very experienced legislators do know how the legislative process is supposed to work, and we think they would, what, how would the, how <coughs> can the incentive be there for, the, for these members to want the budget process to work normally? Because it hasn't for many years. The shutdown was an egregious example of a lack of, um, of action. Um, but it, 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 each year this goes on. And so I'm wondering how can we, how can we bring, how can these members find the incentive to want to have this process work normally? What do we do? How do we figure this out? How do we engage in meaningful conflict? And that is the space that we are trying to open up right now. So there's a will there. It's just nobody has quite been thrown away. One more question. Then we'll wrap it up. Me? Yeah. Hi, uh, Alexis Bergeron. And my apologies to Dr. Azari, but my question is for the legislative staffers again. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about your bill solution. Um, for instance, is there um, anything stopping under your solution from a simple vote to lift the automatic sequester? Because um, that seems like a pretty simple workaround that we've seen happen before. Sure. No, there's nothing prohibiting such a vote. Um, I mean, obviously, <laughs> we'd, we'd like to have um, we, we'd like to have our bill facilitate um, passage of regular appropriations bills. Um, not not to sort of hinder the appropriations process and sort of an excuse to just have these cuts without Congress's consent. Um, so Congress could either pass a longer CR at any time. They could pass the regular the applicable appropriations bills. That's kind of the whole, that's kind of the goal of the legislation. It's also important to know that Congress can't find people. So I just want to thank everybody for coming. I know some of our panelists do have to leave. For those who do not, and if there's time afterwards that you all would like to get together and chat, by all means, uh, please do so. But, uh,